just by way of introduction, um, I have four guys on stage with me today. I'm Ryan Zarama from Commerce Guys. I'm the erstwhile project lead of Ubercart and now Drupal Commerce since Drupal 7 uh, has come out. And um, I'm joined by four guys that have been uh, really some of the early adopters of the software, uh, both in building really complex sites, um, building some of the essential contributed modules that we've needed to flesh out what Drupal Commerce can do. Um, and also there's just been really good uh, contributors back to the project in terms of bug review, patch review, really supportive, so really glad to have contributors like this. Um, I'll let them introduce themselves, starting with Jamie and on down. Hi, I'm Jamie Wiseman. I'm a lead developer at SubHub. Hi there, I'm Richard Jones. I'm the technical director of ICOS. Hi, I'm Jacob Zorb, and I'm a developer at Revealed IT. Hi, I'm Peter Freelamp and work for CanDo Image, a Swiss land-based web agency. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Uh, so which, who's coolest? Like, did we get any feel for their personalities? <laughs> OK. There we go. <laughs> All right, uh, and we really do, with Drupal Commerce, value um, every contributor. So I'm so happy. I really, I really believe in the power of the community to develop even a very complex piece of software. And uh, I'm, I'm really impressed with people like Peter, um, who start working on Drupal on the most complex site uh, that I've seen uh, as, as their first introduction with Drupal Commerce still in alpha and Drupal 7 not out yet. And I mean, like, he, he's an early adopter par excellence. So, um, so I'm, I'm really impressed with these guys. And I, and I hope that uh, what they have to show you about what they've been working on uh, will give you some idea of what you can do when you develop sites with Drupal Commerce. And we will be looking at uh, mostly screenshots of things that they've actually built with them discussing the implementation. I'm not actually going to pull up any code because I don't think you'll be able to read it anyways. Um, but if you want to talk code afterwards, feel free to find any of us. We've all got our hands dirty. Um, but we'll just uh, dive in with the presentation here. So um, one thing that I like to do whenever I give a Drupal Commerce presentation is uh, sort, of, sort of frame uh, the discussion so you understand where we've come from and where we think we're going with Drupal Commerce. Uh, so obviously I started my Drupal development with Ubercart. And whenever we started uh, working on Ubercart, we had a very application mindset, thinking what should Ubercart be able to do? And let's use Drupal as just sort of the base. This provides the CMS functionality. Ubercart is the e-commerce application. It needs a feature list. And so we would just work toward those features. And what we eventually did is we worked ourselves into a hole, um, because some features never worked together, such as uh, VAT and coupons, I think. You, know, you still couldn't you know, get your taxes right around that. Uh, Multi-currency never really worked uh, great at a core, a core level. And, um, and then just, you know, if we didn't have features there, the question and the issue wasn't, you know, how can I build this using all these other contributed modules from Drupal, but why doesn't Ubercart do this? And so we're really trying to deflect a lot of those questions now by focusing more on being an e-commerce framework. Uh, and so we, I, I guess it would be fair to say we are a little bit more than just a framework. Um, if, you, if you want to be a framework purist. Uh, but we have this framework mentality where the core of Drupal Commerce uh, is just the core systems and components you need to do e-commerce on top of Drupal. Um, and so and what, I guess what that looks like is we have you know, a few core entities and fields that I'll introduce in a minute, uh, things like a shopping cart and a checkout form. Uh, but, but we aren't hard coding business rules. We aren't hard coding any sort of business logic into the modules themselves. Instead, we're, we're depending on other modules like views and rules and entity to provide a lot of this configurable um, e-commerce functionality um, on the back end. Uh, so so with, uh, with Ubercart and with Magento and OS Commerce and a lot of other e-commerce applications, the question you might come to it with is, what can I do with this? Uh, with Drupal Commerce, the question we want you to have when you come to it is, what can I build with it? And if you need a good starting point, there are distributions and, and other ways that, like, like Commerce Kickstart, that will help you start doing something quick. But still, the big question is, what can I, what can I build with it? And I think that uh, the, the testimony of these guys will be that they've been able to build some quite diverse stuff, all using the same core project, uh, without having to do any hacking of core, I hope. Um, and with you know, contributing a lot of patches helps you not have to hack core, right? Um, so you know, moving on. We have also this slide that we've used since Chicago to sort of explain uh, what I feel is the Drupal Commerce uh, ecosystem or platform. Um, we're starting, of course, with, with Drupal, and Drupal Commerce is the foundation of everything. And uh, we actually did just get a Drupal Commerce 1.0 release 
uh, two nights ago. Yeah, so it was really exciting. Um, <laughs> we, uh, we, actually, we actually wore out one of our developers. He just had to go home. Boyan's no longer with us. Uh, <laughs> uh, but no, it was, it was a bit of a marathon just to make sure we had all of our tests are passing. There's no critical issues. And really, it is production ready. We're, we're using it in production sites. These guys all have production sites. And uh, we're really confident in the strength of our foundation. So I really think the solid tag on the side is, is really fitting. Uh, but it, is, it doesn't do everything. It's not a robust e-commerce application at its core. So for the application type features, uh, we're depending on what we call essential contributed modules. And so there are things, those are things like Jacob's shipping module. You know, if you want to do uh, calculated shipping or flat rate shipping, that's not essential to what e-commerce is, the business of you know, finding out what somebody wants to purchase and taking their money. It is pretty essential for a lot of people doing e-commerce. So this is, this is an essential contributed module for us. It's one that, even though it's not part of core, um, we'll be maintaining, I'll be helping maintain right along with the core modules. And that's actually been my focus for the last week before the con, uh, is shipping and other payment modules like PayPal and CyberSource and Authorize. And I guess these guys have a host of other payment modules they'll talk about in a few minutes. Uh, but then on top of these essential contributed modules, we still know that that's not going to be usable uh, for most people, like a, a casual store administrator, a, a newcomer to e-commerce, because you still have to know how to install a Drupal module, how to configure a view, how to build a rule. Um, and, and that's you know, almost a programming language in itself. So what we're going to do is target pre-configured features and use case specific distributions of Drupal. Uh, these are things like the Commerce Kickstart, which takes the core Drupal Commerce modules and packages them up into a store out of the box. It's, it's a very minimal store right now, uh, but we have the, the ability for it to create example content and, and guidelines, perhaps, for you to know how to use the Commerce modules and how to, how to start building a store successfully. And then the, the last piece of the ecosystem, of course, is that even that won't be enough for everybody, so we still need accessible experts and integrators, whether it's Commerce guys, one of our partners, one of these guys on stage, or one of the many developers that have been contributing in the queue. Um, and then, you know, of course, whenever we talk about accessible experts and integrators in support for e-commerce, uh, we also are happy to announce that this con, uh, that uh, Commerce guys will be partnering with Acquia to actually have service level agreement type support for e-commerce sites on Drupal. So that's really exciting for us because it, it really brings a measure of uh, viability, in a sense, to Drupal as an e-commerce platform for large-scale corporations to know that they can actually have dependable, predictable support of the software. <coughs> So what we're going to talk about in the next uh, questions and, and things that I, I present to our panel are how do these guys make use of our core entities and fields, um, which are things like a product entity, line items which go on orders, uh, customer profiles which capture billing and shipping information, and payment transactions which of course capture every attempted transaction and the result from the gateway. Um, so we'll be discussing these. I'm going to slide really quickly through these slides. They'll be online with more description if you want to read through them later. Uh, we'll go through these core entities and fields, and we'll also talk about our core commerce systems, uh, one of the primary ones of which is the product pricing system, which I'll introduce in detail in about 10 or 15 minutes. Um, so we have the, the product pricing system for all of our dynamic pricing and taxes and discounts and fees and currency conversion and everything else, all working through the rules module. We have our shopping cart, which all works through the views module. Um, we have a checkout system that has the drag and drop form builder, multi-page, single page, you name it. And then, of course, we have a payment system that uh, everybody's going to have to deal with one way or another. Uh, so having introduced Drupal Commerce and the core entities and fields and core systems, I want to start asking our panel some interesting questions. Uh, so the first one is, how can you customize the buying experience with Drupal Commerce? Uh, you know, are, are you locked into one paradigm? Do you even need a shopping cart? Uh, if you've used Ubercart, you're familiar with the, 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 the cart module containing all of the checkout codes. There is no separation between a cart and checkout. So what I'd like these guys to do is to show us you know, how exactly they've been able to customize the buying experience, and in some cases, get rid of the shopping cart and checkout altogether and still use commerce as the base for their e-commerce system. Um, so first, I want to pitch this to Rich. You know, how have you guys at iCost customized the buying experience for your clients? Okay, uh, thanks, Ryan. So what we've got actually to show you first is a really, really simple example. Um, this particular site we were building didn't need quantities because they were selling unique products. Um, and really, one thing Mike Ryan mentioned there, which 
it's just so critical and really, really, really powerful is that the cart and the cart block are now powered by views. So in this particular example here, we were able to just redefine the view so that we took the quantity column away. Um, again, very, very simple example, but the fact is now, in Ubercart, we would have had to go into the theme layer, we'd have to have a messing around with the cart, form waters, all sorts of things. But now, because it's all views, it's very, very simple, and you can just change that exactly as you want. And it's the same with, um, with the cart block as well. Yeah, it's really exciting, actually, that we got the views form functionality is now a part of views 3 itself, um, so that you can actually build you know, drag and drop form. Um, not just with commerce, but I, I assume that other modules are going to start using it too, but I don't know of any yet. Um, so we're the first ones to find the bugs. <laughs> um, and then I guess we also have Peter, uh, if you want to talk about Euro centers. And uh, just tell me when to flip your slides. And yeah, um, Euro centers is a very special case where we uh, sell language courses in foreign countries. So you can't buy several courses at the time. And that's why we totally bypass the cart as you know it, and we changed it to a, uh, some kind of a product configuration. This means this one is customized. This whole part shows all the options a language course can have. And if you switch it, actually what you see here in this corner is the cart view. So, and with some Ajax magic, you can have it like changing something in the page, in the configuration, and you see immediately the change of the price and, and fees and all that stuff. So, no cart icon, and another idea behind that is the user experience and the conversion rate. You don't allow the customer to escape <laughs> somehow. <laughs> you, have, you have this one way. Now, well, you, f you found a cool school now decide what you really want, and then let's go traveling and learn foreign languages. <laughs> <laughs> and do they even do checkout on here, or is it just like booking and then pay offline right now? Um, they have a checkout flow with okay. an overview, but no payment at the moment, because our customer um, takes really care of every detail of the travel and, and gets in touch with them oh, yeah. and, and provides more information and, yeah, some kind of offline upselling. Okay. <laughs> Great. Thanks, Peter. Uh, and then uh, Jamie with Subhub, if you want to talk about uh, your, your custom buying experience and, and what you've done to make it work, that'd be great. Sure, sure. Um, so our core offering is basically a, a subscription model where users are signing up for our client sites and buying effectively a role. Um, <coughs> so this here is, we, we invented a new um, product type uh, called a subscription um, and th this here is just a view displaying the uh, well it would be more roles but there's only <laughs> one <laughs> um, and it, it's really um, because our users are, are quite low level they, they want a very simple experience so it's literally you click the button go to your checkout page and it all happens on there you can't actually see the submit button underneath but it would be there if I had a bigger screen to capture. Is this a custom checkout form or using the core checkout? This is actually completely custom. It bypasses the, the core okay. checkout completely. So we've built the form that utilizes the entities off of, off of the product. Okay. Um, when you hit submit, some Ajax magic happens, so it goes back, generates the order, and adds the line items to it. Um, and then redirects to PayPal, and when PayPal happens, other stuff happens. Do you have to be a magic user to start using Drupal Commerce? <laughs> a magic user? <laughs> yeah, yeah, you guys are talking Ajax magic and stuff. But the, hair the buried entry is not so high, but if you want to learn magic, I mean, we can teach. Well, <laughs> marketing buzzword. Marketing buzzword, OK, OK. <laughs> cool. Um, and so yeah, so these guys, uh, I guess so we, we started with Rich. They're saying that you can use views in the UI even to, to sort of affect the buying experience in the, the cart block and cart form level. And then we have uh, Peter bypassing the add cart form entirely. Uh, Jamie's now bypassing checkout and doing his own thing. And then lastly, I think, Jacob, you had one where you guys just, uh, you, don't, you don't even use cart or checkout, right? That's that? right. OK. I think this is a good example of how you know, dual commerce can be used as a framework. And you don't, you're not locked in to do it in a certain way like you are with Ubercard. And now this page is what you get to 
on, on a side roommate, uh, it's a printing company, and it doesn't actually use products. Uh, it uses web form instead. And the problem is that we, we faced is that they, they have a very complex price calculation. So if you order like 10 magazines, it's one price, 20 magazines is different price. So instead of making like millions of permutations of products, we make a web form where you can fill in different stuff as you would with a product. And when you click order, you get this page. And you can see on the top left is, is the details from that uh, web form with the basically product info. And on the right hand side, you have the, the customer details. In order to, to use this stuff, they need to be what we call a, a pro customer. So they, they are known by, by the company and they have an agreement. So they, have, they, they already have a custom, customer profile. So we, we pull that in uh, using uh, the, the customer profile entity. And there is some different fields for, um, for the order. You can give it an, a title uh, so you can search on it uh, and manage your own orders. And at the bottom, we have a, a file uh, widget where you can upload multiple files. Typically, you want to, uh, to have a printing files, saying if you print a magazine, you have a cover, you have all the, the pages. And, and basically, what it went for is, is have a single page where you can do all of that stuff. And at the bottom, you, you just click Submit. And behind the scenes, we, we managed to create a, a web form submission. We link that to the line item. We add the, the, the price from the calculation. We add the, the images uh, or the printing files. And we add the order info at the order. And all of that we link together a, as a single order. And we send them off to, to a completion page. And because of the, the common system, they can use, they can see their orders and uh, the, the the people at the printing company they can use the, the the back end of commerce to to see all the orders that's made and they're notified by email and and they have different customers they are they have a system they call project managers so they manage different com uh, companies uh, so they handle maybe they need to, to 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 talk about when the printing can be done or they need to push it ahead and stuff like that so they can still see all the, the orders coming through on the front end as well. The customers can go and review their order history and everything. E exactly. And, and that's, that's still core functionality? Or did you customize yeah, that? That's, yeah, that's basic commerce core. You know, we, we customize the, some of the, the functionality on, on, the, on the user page where you can see your, the orders. So we added some search functionality. And we added some, some advanced views integration. So uh, different users that's are part of the same company can s can see all the orders that's okay. been made. Um, cool. So and and the back end that's totally just commerce, yeah. more or less out of the box. Cool. Yeah. So what we're, what we're trying to sort of give a, a big picture here of is that, um, you know, you can do anything. <laughs> you, you can customize this tailor make it to a, a particular business uh, need, um, whether it's. Uh, no cart, no checkout, orders entered on the back end. You could use it as an invoicing system where you create an order and then just send a customer a checkout URL. You don't have to have the cart module. You don't have to have the checkout module. Uh, but, but I should say that, you know, uh, what, what, what's, how, what's, what's the double negative here? Non-developers can still use this. So you don't have to be like an, an advanced, you know, core patch contributor uh, to be able to, to, to build a store um, and, and maybe we should have started with just like a, a generic example of here's the experience out of the box. Uh, because we still are providing you know, the, the card experience, the checkout experience, um, and then uh, rules that, that, that execute on checkout completion to create user accounts and email notifications, update order statuses, and all the like. Um, we just didn't demonstrate that. We sort of went straight for the, hey, we can customize it. Um, but you know, we, I think developers tend to gravitate to, oh, I can just rewrite anything I want to. And that may be intimidating for some of you. Uh, but we are still very much concerned with the out-of-the-box experience. Um, and uh, we've had Boyan Summers, been a really integral part of the team. Uh, he's uh, on the usability team for Drupal 7, and he's really been making sure that, that what we're doing conforms to best practices and, and uh, is, is good for, for core and for e-commerce conversions. So um, that's 
that's the gist of the first question, I suppose. How can we customize the, the buying experience? And if you have any further questions, uh, maybe hold on to them and you can refer back to something that somebody said, and we'll have time for Q&A at the end. Uh, but I want to move on to uh, w one of the, what I think is the, the pinnacle achievements, I guess, of Drupal Commerce in its core product pricing system. I introduced this just a little bit ago as the, the main thing uh, through which every product price is calculated. And what happens is whenever you want to see a product on a page, if I want to go to, to, to this t-shirt's product page or something, it's going to have a price there. But the way we arrive at that price is we package it up into a line item as though it was in my shopping cart right now. We send it through rules, and then all the different rules that are attached to this event called calculate the sell price of a product, they can alter the unit price of this line item. So they can say add a tax, um, subtract this discount, convert to this currency based on where the user's shopping from, and all of these changes are going to be stored inside this price uh, data array. So we actually have like a change log of what's happened to every price on the page. Um, so that whichever rules got executed, whether it was, you know, the, the well, you can't really read those, can you? Uh, you know, whether it was taxes, whether it was discounts, you can actually come back and see this trail of how did I arrive at this price, which lets you do some fun things. Like, uh, I think uh, I won't steal Rich's thunder, but it lets you do some fun things with that data on the product page itself. And then also these prices at the unit price level will then make their way over to the total of line item, down to the order total, and display to you um, on the checkout pages and cart pages, sort of a breakdown of how much of this is the base price of the product, how much of this was you know, your, your VAT, how much of this was your membership or bulk reseller discount, and then your grand order total. And it's, it's very flexible in terms of display. You can have, uh, um, I guess, price components or things that get altered onto the price that don't display up front and only appear at the end, uh, such as US type sales tax and maybe sales tax in other countries where you calculate it uh, up front, but you don't display it until you actually display the order total. Uh, but you can also do your VAT, whether you do it through a pricing rule or on the product edit page, entering your prices, including a particular VAT rate. Um, so it's, it's really flexible in terms of uh, how, when, where uh, you actually alter the price and what you do with the data after the fact. Um, and so I guess what I'd like to do is maybe just start with uh, Eurocenters, Peter, and uh, just, just uh, explain to us how you've used the pricing system and maybe how you haven't used it. Because I think that you have an interesting case of, you know, a few hundred thousand products to avoid just using this system. Yes, indeed. Um, <coughs> our approach was that we need to know all the prices of all the courses within the pri valid price range, and each option has an effect of the price. So we're pre-generating actual 430,000 <laughs> products. <laughs> Um, that's for a one and a half a year, the prices. And then we add, it, at that step we add fees and whatever is possible to these prices as price components. So if you choose uh, another date, you actually switch the product that's pre-generated. So we can skip a whole bunch of very complex logic on execution. But in addition to that, we have fees that are not possible to pre-generate. Mm -hmm. So we use uh, the rules event Ryan mentioned to add them on execution. So it's it's quite an interesting mix, especially because we are are also handling um, multi-currency in, in several different ways. How are you doing currency conversion? Um, we started with a a currency price field. Uh, every currency had, had its own price field, and if you calculate the sell price, we do some geolocation lookup and whatsoever to determine the matching currency for the user and setting it as price in the commerce line item. Okay, so you're swapping one price field from the product in for the actual purchase price, is that? Exactly. Okay. That was the start, because our customer had the wish to um, do that for all currency except Swiss francs. So now we have an exception and Swiss francs are <laughs> calculated or converted <laughs> on the fly. So first result, you have to decide actually whether you do some calculation conversion on execution or you have to use this field approach. Well, we see now you can use both of them. <laughs> 
And I don't know if I already should announce it, but there is a module in work right now <laughs> that <laughs> helps you to decide what to use and, and helps to switch between these models. It's going to be done by next week's uh, Commerce yeah, Camp, right? It has to because That's of right. the, the pressure of an announcement. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Um, and I, I can't remember. Yeah, so you, you've, you've sort of combined like using product pricing rules, but not just depending on the system entirely. Was, there, was it for performance reasons, or was it just because you're importing everything from an external database? Or what exactly caused you to, to want to pre-compile all these different prices up front? Well, we get the data for the prices in Excel. Okay. So it's quite fun to get that into a <laughs> system, <laughs> and, and there's no um, enterprise resource planet planning system in place yet okay. uh, on our customer side. So we decided we just use nearly the Excels as they do it internally. And the idea was really to um, have a benefit in, in, in performance to okay. have all that calculated before. Because you have to imagine you have school holidays and, and uh, national holidays and all that stuff. And you have to pre-calculate course prices on, on yeah, these dates and, and really heavy operations. And doing this for every <laughs> single thing <laughs> would be just too much. Yeah, yeah. so the idea is that, that rules is very flexible and powerful as a programming language inside of Drupal. But it's not the end all be all. And there's, there's no reason to avoid either writing custom conditions and actions for your pricing rules or to even bypass you know, rules-based calculations entirely and sort of pre-compile and pre-calculate all the variations and sh dump them into the database directly. So, exactly. Yeah. And I have to say, it was the planning was done before the price cache with rules was in place. Yeah, so yeah. We <laughs> were really early with all that stuff. <laughs> yep. That's uh, the joys of being bleeding edge, right? <laughs> Indeed. Uh, and so then, uh, so Peter's talked about maybe some of the configuration on the back end and the types of things you can do when you're, when you're developing complex pricing systems. Rich, if you wouldn't mind just giving us a brief introduction to that very fuzzy part of the screen up top, uh, what you can do whenever you're actually displaying a price. Since you have all of this, uh, this price data, the component data, what went into making this price this price, what have you done to display that in an interesting way for the customer? OK, so um, hopefully, actually, we, the case studies we've got are more um, generic and more sort of simple-based stores. Um, and the really important thing, again, for us here was that, and especially in, in Europe and the UK, is that VAT is now really sorted out in dual commerce, whereas in Ubercar it was always a pain. Um, so here we've got uh, VAT, but because, as, as Ryan was saying, prices are calculated by rules, it means we can do some really great stuff. Um, so in, in this particular case, this site is a site that went live a couple of weeks ago. Um, they were running a special promotion, so everything was 33% off in August. Um, so we were able to write a very simple rule that's checked the date before the price was calculated and says, OK, if the date is before the 31st of August, we're going to subtract that 33% off. And based on that and the VAT calculations, we were able to then split that. What you're seeing there where it says actually it says RRP and offer price. What we've done there is we've taken the component prices and selectively chosen which ones to display. So normally you would display the user's, uh, the customer's calculated price, which might be based on, as, as in our case, the date, or it might be based on a particular role, for example, if you want to give a role a discount. So you can do all these really, really good things with the rules. Um, so what we've done there is we showed the original price prior to calculation as the RRP, and then we've shown the customer price, which in this case is anyone can come in and get this discount if it's just based on date. But we could also have done that using a coupon, for example. If I put a coupon code in up front, I can see my prices on the site. So this is all completely dynamic. And you can see the prices that you're actually going to pay. And that could be completely different depending on who you are, because it's all accessed through rules. And again, you know, we've not done any heavy customization here. This is all stuff that's out of the box. And the views and rules integrations are just so key to this whole project and have made it massively powerful in terms of stuff that before you would have contributed modules all over the place doing this stuff, <laughs> and now there's, just, there's none. Yeah, and one of, the, one of the strengths, I guess, of us building on top of Drupal 7's field system is that if you need a price to display in a different way like this, all you have to do is write a display formatter for it. 
And I mean, the, the code for that is, is not that complex. Um, That's right, yeah. Is that what you did? Again, yeah. in this case, this is uh, one template. That was the only, only, only override template we had to use for this entire site. Okay. Was this, because we did the rest in Display Suite. But, you know, it's very, very simple to just make that one change. Great. Let's zoom back out here. And then, uh, you know, we were going to say, too, that uh, this, this product pricing system, you know, it's even going to handle the same uh, shipping calculations in a similar manner to, uh, to what your, your product price calculations are determined, right? So this is pretty new functionality in uh, shipping, right? Good. Yeah, I think it, we made it in, like, a few weeks ago or something like that. Okay. So, so the problem we've been ha having with shipping is that before we used the, the price components, we would uh, create a line item and, and display that like you see at the top, you know, that's the product uh, line item. So we would display the shipping line items as well. But there wasn't a good way to combine the two because, you know, the shipping line items and product line items are different. You know, the, the product line items have a reference to a product and the shipping line items don't really have that. You uh, don't really want people m removing their shipping from the cart, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, so this is where you have done the, the shipping. Uh, so, so the problem is, how do you display that to the customer in, in, a, in a good way? Um, and the, 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 the way we, we did it was to allow uh, shipping modules to define their own uh, price component. So, so what we, we have here, you can see we have the subtotal and the, and the shipping, and then the order total. And that is something that pretty much is handled by commerce out of the box because we decided to to define the, the, the price component when you, we created the, the shipping line item. So we just tell commerce, oh, this is not your, your user base price, this is uh, the shipping quote. And by doing that, commerce will, will spread out uh, the, the prices as it does with, with tax handling, and it will it makes a very nice way to display to the customer, this is your shipping fee, this is like your, your order fee, this is the taxes and all of that, uh, is, and and it's very easy to do. I think it was like two or three lines of code uh, to, to handle that, and and you know it works perfectly. And so the the idea is that this whole part of the checkout form is a view. It can be customized if you want to to include images or extra information, attribute information or whatever. And then uh, this this uh, this part of the the, uh, the view is what's called an area handler. It's new to views three. Instead of just being able to put text into the header or the footer, you can plug in you know, this, this area plugin. So this one just takes the order total and um, uses its display format or the order total field's display format to split out all the components. And so that, the idea is that, that even though the shipping line item hasn't been displayed in the view itself, the view had a filter that said, you know, only display product line item types. It's, it's not displayed up top, but because the shipping line item is on the order and so it gets added into the order total field, Whenever we display the order total using the display formatter that says, hey, break everything up, it shows up. And um, you know, whenever you're configuring your product pricing rules, you even have a select list where you can say, which price component should this be? So anyone that's been defined on the site or any additional price component that you define in code, uh, you can choose so that you, your store administrators know how to, how to register different adjustments to the code or adjustments to the price. Um, so we'll move on from there. The, that's the product pricing system. Um, it, it all, oh, I was going to say, there's one advantage of it all working through rules. And this is, this, I, don't, I don't even know if anybody's using this yet. So if you are, please raise a hand. What we can do is, is take all of the permutations of your product prices and just put them into a database table so that you can then sort and filter views based on the calculated price, even though that calculation is happening in PHP. I, I don't know that that's being used yet, but that's the primary motivation for us to handle all of our price calculation through rules. If you're just allowing modules to hook in and alter prices willy-nilly, uh, we wouldn't have like, any, any dependable or predictable way to, to tell which rules are going to apply for this user and how we join to the table and so on and so forth. So um, if you're interested in that, come find me afterwards because I'd love to find you know, good people that we can, can show off as, hey, we actually made this work. Um, but that's, that's why all the product pricing happens through rules, if you're curious. Um, so the, the next thing that everybody's had to do here, except for Peter, because this client doesn't like taking money online, um, is, is how should you best integrate with payment services? And uh, if, you're, if you're looking to find which payment services have already been integrated, uh, you can go to drupalcommerce.org contrib. And I think there's a list of maybe like two dozen or so 
payment modules, including a 3D secure module, um, that, are, that have been developed for different markets. Uh, I think the US, South America, and Europe have, have some. I'm not sure if there's any for Asia yet. Uh, maybe Alipay has been done. But uh, the idea is that, that uh, Drupal Commerce defines this core payment system uh, that can, on the checkout form, uh, process transactions, or from the admin form, process transactions. And every time a transaction is attempted, uh, whether it fails or is successful or requires further action like a capture or an e-check to clear, we create a payment transaction entity and associate it with the user's order. And uh, then uh, you have a view of payment transaction entities on the back end that you can go and look at to determine if the order has been paid in full, if there are payments outstanding, or if somebody can't figure out why is my payment keep failing, you can actually look at the, uh, the API response from the gateway and determine you know, what is it that's causing this to fail. And so um, I guess, uh, does, does anybody have anything they'd like to add about you know, how you've integrated payment services, whether it's from recurring or special needs for European gateways or redirected gateways that we could just sort of give people an idea if they have to develop their own? Well, the <laughs> defer to... <laughs> I'll, I'll do it. Well, the, the payment system at its, at its core is also very dependent on rules, and that is one thing you need to, to understand, and it's very general term in commerce is you, you, we use rules for almost everything because then you can customize it uh, within the interface. And, and basically, when you create a, a, a payment method, uh, commerce will create an, a rule for that. And you can set up when do you want to apply it. Do you want it to be enabled at all? And at what, what conditions do you want it? So you could create a, a payment method that would basically uh, skip if, if, the, if, the, if the order total was, was zero. Uh, but on, you only want to show that if the order total is zero. I mean, but if you have an order total higher than that, then you want a different payment system. Uh, so, and, and what you need to do to actually integrate it is, is pretty simple because Commerce will expose some callbacks to your function to, to allow you to, to add some form elements if you want to do like inline payment and it will, it will call your function at, uh, at redirect time, you know, to, to if you want to handle when, when the payment is happening offsite and all of that. And, and basically what you need to do when, when the customer re returns is, is to send them off to, to uh, a, an encoded URL that will tell Commerce this transaction is okay and Commerce Core will handle sending uh, the customer to the next step because because of the, the, the way you can customize the, the, your checkout flow, you may have a single form or you may have like a, a multiple steps and you don't know, you know how is it customized, but Commerce exposes an API so you just tell Commerce, okay, I'm done, take it to the next step. <laughs> and, and that is a good way to, to, to show off Commerce that is very flexible, but the, the APIs for the developers is also very, is very well thought of. So you, you don't have to figure out where to send them. You just you, you handle that to commerce itself. Yeah, this is a, a big advantage, I think, for developers, especially in Europe, where I think most of your payment is off-site, right? You go away and you have to come back somewhere. And so, so the idea is that in the US, you know, most, of your, most of your stuff is going to be on-site. So we have helper functions to assist in credit card payment on-site, so that uh, you have a credit card form, credit card validation routines, and then, of course, no storage of any credit card data ever. Um, and so that, that'll get a lot of use in the U.S. gateways and, and elsewhere. Uh, but then when you're de dealing with all these redirected payment services, we really wanted to have the same checkout workflow uh, that you would have if you were paying on site. So we don't, we don't want to introduce you know, two forked you know, checkout workflows, especially on the same site. And that's, that's, I guess, where we've kind of been before is that you know, the PayPal module for Ubercard had to you know, define its own return URLs and its own completion URLs. And now, now we're saying that... Uh, you know, whenever you go out, the same point that you leave the site from is the point that you'll come back to. And using the order status, we keep track of which step you are at in checkout. Uh, so that whenever you come back from the gateway, we know how to send you to the next page. And we know if we get a payment notification in. Whenever you receive a payment notification, your, your module would be responsible for, for calling the checkout completion routine uh, that, that then you know, handles all the business logic of an order. So as soon as you know payment has been received, you are you know, telling uh, Drupal Commerce to create the user account or send the notification, update the order status, or so on. 
And, and then, it, you know, it won't duplicate it, but whenever the customer comes back from the site, then they'll go on to the next page and all as well. They, they don't know, and, and your site doesn't have to know that there were two different types of payment happening. Uh, so that's, it's been a breeze for me, because um, I've, I've uh, traditionally maintained a lot of payment modules, um, and, you know, we're still churning out more. I think, um, you know, just by, by a quick uh, survey on the stage, which ones have you integrated or have you used? Maybe starting with Jacob on down. I've done uh, dips and uh, pegs and ePay. Okay. Yeah, we've been working on the SagePay, all three directs, redirects, and form based. Okay, and you guys also did uh, 3D Secure? Oh, uh, yeah. Um, for the direct one, we had to do 3D Secure support as well. Um, what we tried to do is abstract 3D Secure out so that other people using direct can use that 3D Secure. Cool. Um, and we were able to do that by just, uh, as I say, with uh, commerce, you're able to define extra checkout steps pages or checkout yeah. panes, so we were able to do it that way. Cool. And Jamie? Yeah, we used um, PayPal, but purely just for subscriptions, which is a okay. slightly different API to the standard one. Okay, yeah. Of course, yeah. and pay, that was fun. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I, uh, I, just, I just have a bad history with recurring payments. <laughs> so, so it's just, it, it's like the, the thorn in everyone's side, I think. So, and there are probably plenty of people out here that have some horror stories about trying to make recurring work you know, through Ubercard or on Drupal in general. Uh, so my strategy now is to try to avoid it and uh, to use instead a third-party service called Recurly uh, to, to manage all that stuff. These guys were brave and tackled it. Uh, but you know, I'm sure that a native solution will be in Contrib eventually. Um, I'm going to it's stay actually, away. <laughs> it's actually in the common subscription module. It's already, OK, that's right, yeah, yeah. It kind of yeah. should be split out, but okay. we'll do yeah. that soon. Cool. Well, um, so in addition to interacting with uh, payment gateways, Another thing that you're going to be interacting with if you have any sort of uh, custom type store is the line item system. And uh, just for a brief introduction uh, to the line item entity, uh, what it is is it's a default entity type that we define that has a unit price and a total price and a quantity. I think that's it. And then you'll have different types of line items. So, so these, uh, you define a new type of line item for anything that's going to add to the total of an order. So by default, you get a product line item type, and that's it. Uh, the shipping module defines a shipping line item type. Um, various people have defined their own custom line item types. Um, and, and what you do is you can add any additional fields to them that you need uh, to, to capture the data for that line item type. So the product line item types all have a product reference field. So you don't actually put the product data directly into the line item. It just says this line item represents this customer purchasing uh, product five. And uh, whenever it uh, has that association, I guess, you then can access the product data through your rules and through views to display them in the shopping cart or to make discounts. Uh, and you can even, if you have additional fields through the user interface attached to your line item types, you can expose those line item fields through the add to cart form to create a sort of customizable product. And so the idea there is that um, you can, uh, uh, I guess, turn the add to cart form into more of a pro uh, I don't, know how, I don't know how to put a product form. Uh, you can say, like, like, OK, how about a registration form for an event? You might put in there their, their, their real name, their email address, and their company in the Add to Cart form, so you're purchasing a registration you know, for a person to that event. And you can do this all through the user interface just by adding a field to a line item type and clicking a little checkbox that says, hey, show this on the Add to Cart form. And uh, then you know, once the user enters that data, it's available to you through views to then expose through the cart block, through the cart form. Um, one use case that we came up with in the training, has, has anybody used the UC variable price module that I wrote? Maybe? A few? Okay, cool. So the idea behind this module is that um, people wanted to use Ubercart for donations. And uh, so what we wanted was a product that could have a variable price based on customer entry. So we added a, this, this price field to the, uh, the add to cart form, and then we would store that amount that the customer entered in the, price, the, the product's data array. And then whenever Ubercart loaded this, this cart, you know, we would alter the price in. Uh, what, we've, what we can do now is you can actually just add a custom price field to your line item type and then create a product pricing rule that says, you know, if this field has data, swap it in for the price of the product. And so suddenly, you, you, you know, we're, we're deprecating a lot of modules just by using rules and using views. Uh, so I, I think uh, if you could maybe pass the mic down to Julian, I want to put him on the spot. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Because I have here a screenshot from his latest work where he's not just uh, interacting with a line item system to create custom line item types, um, but he's, he's done a full, like, customizable product creator, right? 
Yeah. So just the, explain this to us. What's going on here in this page? The idea of this project was to be able to create some products to customize directly through an app Flash application. And the idea is that you have those buttons. Uh, with those buttons, you can add some text and some images. And you have some something that we call the printing zone, where you can add and move and resize and rotate those elements. And once you click on the Save uh, Customization <coughs> button, a thumbnail is generated. And this thumbnail is stored directly, directly in the light item as a field that we call the variation. And with this that is a custom field type? Or? Yeah, it's the okay. custom field type. Uh, we are storing in that uh, XML data for the Flash app, and we are also uh, storing uh, the path of the thumbnails and uh, an SVG version. And th the idea is that you can uh, switch with the uh, HTML that you are seeing, the I different images, the colors, and you have also the size and the printing techniques. And this is some uh, advanced HTML. It's not just <laughs> the select list or the radio buttons. We had to implement that too. And uh, once you are clicking on the Add to Cart form, you are going to your cart. And in the cart, we are directly displaying the thumbnails of the generated products. And are you exposing you line item fields through the Add to Cart form on this? Sorry? Are, are you using the, the, uh, the functionality to expose fields on the line item to the Add to Cart form? Yeah. OK. Which, which, where would that be represented on the page? Is that just this, uh, the design bar? Or? Yeah. OK. Yeah, so I mean, what, what I find really interesting about this project is that it's still using the basic add to cart form just right out of the box. So you have you know, your quantity selector, you have attribute selectors. So if you've attached a size attribute to this product type or a color one, you know, those are still showing up here. But it's like you've totally you know, combined that with the custom line item type to create just like a whole custom interface for building products. Uh, so I'm really excited about the project. And this, this uh, actually comes up a lot. Is this, are these. Uh, Radio buttons that you've themed to look like images? Well, or actually, because in HTML, you can't really use some uh, <coughs> random uh, uh, advanced edge markup uh, inside some labels and stuff like that. We had to use some JavaScript to make okay. sure that we are still using uh, a kind of uh, degraded version, but it's uh, related on the radio buttons and some JavaScript. OK, so there's radio buttons just hidden that those images are not to? OK, cool. Yeah, so uh, that, that feature request actually comes up a lot in the, uh, the issue queue. How can I take the add to cart form and actually use graphical you know, selectors for, for various attributes? We will uh, release some kind of example code for that. We, oh, we have we or we will? We will. All right, an announcement. Now you're on the spot. <laughs> uh, great. Thanks a lot, Julian. And Julian is our lead dev in, uh, or senior dev. I, I don't know exactly the title, but in Paris, uh, he's the guy. <laughs> so thanks, Julian. All right, uh, the, the next question is maybe more um, maybe pre-sales or business-oriented. Uh, what exactly should you keep in mind when quoting complex Drupal commerce projects? And I know at least uh, two of you have worked on very complex sites. I know that we've quoted some, so Damien, if you want to say anything, you'd be welcome to. Um, but if, if you just have any advice for us, you know, when we're developing with Drupal commerce, is there anything specific to way, the way that commerce works that, that is going to send the price up or maybe allow you to bid a lower price? What, how does exactly that worked out for you? Rich? Yeah. Okay. Um, we found actually probably in common with not specifically to commerce projects, but um, it's content really, um, getting people to get their content together. Um, if, we, if we don't have that up front, we really don't know what the job's going to be like. Um, so with commerce specifically, there is a slightly maybe difficult to explain way of doing products in that you have a product and you have a product display. Yeah. And I, I am now fully on board with why that is, <laughs> but um, it can be a little bit of a, a difficult one to explain to, to a customer. Mm -hmm. um, and, and the reason it is like it, I mean, in my opinion anyway, is so you can do stock control on individual yeah. items and, and you can have variable pricing as well. Um, so we found that to be a little bit difficult to, to explain and, and get that message across. Um, and also, I guess, the making sure that we know what the gateway is going to be. Um, at this stage of commerce development, not every gateway is going to be available. Um, so obviously bear that in mind if you're looking at a commerce project is that it, gateway development is not particularly difficult in, in commerce, but it's still a Something takes time to factor yeah. in, yeah. Okay, so so you, well, I guess what you're saying is, uh, look at the pieces that are providing, and what custom development am I going to have to do around importing and maintaining the product catalog and capturing payment? And those, 
That's right, and also uh, one that always comes up is tracking. Um, are they using some sort of special tracking, uh, affiliate tracking, m yeah. mainly what I'm talking about. Obviously, everyone has Google Analytics these days, but often we'll need to put tracking on the checkout process in various places, um, often multiple checkout yeah. places. So uh, <laughs> that's another one just to look out for, because that's where you start to get into custom, custom work. Yeah. And, w and one thing that came up in our BOF discussions in the, the Commerce Mini-Con over in the, the, uh, the college was the idea that um, there are many different types of site administrators, many different people that will be interacting with this e-commerce site. And the back end of Drupal Commerce is going to be fairly intimidating for most of them because it is, it's, it's just a set of views and it's some rules. And if they want to customize any of this stuff, they're going to have to be technical Drupal users. And so I think uh, you know, what we've done on projects is, is really built an entire custom back end. And that's part of the reason we separated out the UI from the API modules in the core commerce package is so that you could do stuff like this, whether it's building your custom views, building custom pages, dashboard widgets, or whatever. You want to keep in mind how exactly will the people that are going to be using this site need to interact with the back end of the site because you're going to end up doing a lot of that development. And I, I don't suppose any of you guys have done any like back end customization or we, we tend to at least do minimal customization of okay. the of the initial views out of the box, um, just to add some filters and stuff like that. But okay. again it's just tweaking the UI really, uh, to, to meet the customer requirements. Okay. And I think uh, Peter, you were really helped on Eurocenters by having like was it like, you know, three thousand pages of wireframes and <laughs> Yeah. I, I think one problem that arises with commerce is you can do nearly everything. So you have <laughs> to know what the customer wants or bring the customer to know what he really wants. Um, that's not like Ubercard, right? You have some, some kind of a closed feature set and you have a dead end and you can say to the customer, well, that's simply not possible or too expensive. Um, with this framework approach, it's really a good investment to create very specific and, and, and detailed concepts. And it won't work always. Like we, we decided for this multi-currency field approach yeah, and yeah. It, it looked promising. <laughs> and really, yeah, that was, was what the customer wanted. But you know, the Euro got weaker and <laughs> then some when they decided, well, we should be more flexible with Swiss francs and other stuff. So even there, no that end, yeah, you yeah. can do it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good, thanks. Um, I guess we'll move on from that question. If anybody has anything else they'd like to add, we're going to do Q and A in just a second. So, uh, the final question, and I'll just field this one: is where can you go for development support, and how can you give feedback or give back to the project? And uh, the primary places that you'll find myself and others are in IRC um, on the same ircfreno.net. The channel is uh, pound Drupal dash commerce, and uh, you'll find me in there at, at way too many hours of the day. Uh, if you need uh, to, to just talk with me about contributing or figuring out how the core works. We're also really working the issue queue like, like madmen. So we're churning through issues and trying to make sure that we're closing stuff out as fast as possible. So bug reports should go there. Feature requests, you know, maybe should go there. Support requests shouldn't go there. Um, so the issue queue is not being used for support. We do have DrupalCommerce.org, and we have some tools pending that Randy's developed for us that I have been negligent in following up with him on. But what we, are, we are using forms, at least for now, and we're looking at how to better use DrupalCommerce.org as, uh, as a support center for at least you know, form-type support. And then, of course, if you need you know, official you know, paid-for support, there's always the Acquia um, e-commerce support stuff that we're doing now. Um, additionally, if you're looking for um, you know, training and things like that, Commerce Guys offers training in our office, but there's also often training going on in conjunction with uh, Drupal Camps and DrupalCon. So, of course, we did a full day of training that we sold out on Monday. And I think we blew some people's minds, and I think we had at least one person that was dissatisfied because he was already a developer, and we were, we were teaching him how, like, how to use the core modules, not how to hack into them deeper. But you know, we, are, we do try to provide a broad overview of commerce and all the functionality, and we are developing a more developer-oriented curriculum that we've been sort of field testing on some of our partners and, and maturing. Uh, and then uh, there's also this uh, commerce camp. If you don't have anything to do next weekend and you're recovered from uh, DrupalCon, uh, it's in Switzerland in, uh, how do you say it? Is it Luzerne? Okay, so it's in Luzerne and it's uh, two days, totally free. You know, imagine that uh, a camp about websites that make money was able to get enough sponsorship to make it free for everybody to come. So uh, they'll be discussing not just Drupal Commerce, it's, it's more like the business of doing business with Drupal, 
Uh, and there will be commerce sessions. I think Peter's doing a couple, and some of the commerce guys are. And I'm not sure if there's any training going on, but um, maybe there is. Um, so yeah, and so then, you know, if, if you want to give back, there's a lot of contributed modules uh, that, that have been developed that need either co-maintainers, and there's still a lot of stuff that needs to be done. Uh, so, so my goal, now that the 1.0 is out, is to really dive headfirst into what essential contributed modules do we need to, to get done and get ready so that Drupal Commerce you know, sort of can begin to compete at the application feature set level on the strength of all of its contributed modules. Uh, so we'll be um, diving into contrib and, and definitely open to people that want to contribute back or help out with some contribs and stuff. So if I can maybe get uh, maybe one of, one of each of you to go down each aisle, and we have a few minutes left for Q&A. Um, if anybody would like to just pose a question, what's about developing with Drupal Commerce? I know we didn't actually show any code, but I'm happy to answer code questions and pull up my ID if you want. Um, or if you just have rules and views questions, feel free to ask those too. So we got one right here in the front. Uh, hey, um, I'm interested in this customer profile entity you've got. I'm working with the CRM code sprint tomorrow. Okay. And I was wondering if is that in a standalone module somewhere that we can play with? Would that be worth building our CRM on top of, or is it worth kind of going our own way with it and seeing where we end up? Yeah, we um, we talked about integration possibilities with modules like Profile Two or Core Profiles at first, um, but what we determined is that a customer profile in Commerce is maybe a, a bit of a unique case because it may have an address, it may not, it may just be there for the purposes of collecting a tax ID. It's kind of uh, it, it's just like information that you need as a store to be able to complete the order. And uh, they, they could have a one-to-many relationship to users, and we could have one customer profile that's shared by multiple users, such as multiple people from the same organization reusing the same billing data or shipping data. Um, so it's in the customer module. I'm not sure that it's going to be super useful for you. Okay. Uh, but feel free to, to come look at the code afterwards if you want, and I can help That'd be good. Thank you. There is, there is an address field module that should be useful for you, though. So it's, it's a standalone contrib called address field. Uh, Damien's been writing that. And it provides you know, the, the Ajaxy uh, multi-country um, address entry field for name and first name and organization name and everything. So uh, that may be useful to you. And we had a question up here. Yeah. Um, was there any sales people or marketing oriented Any sales or marketing people? Yes. Um, I, I, other than the guys that we've had at Commerce Guys, there hasn't been like a whole lot of contributions from that area. Are you thinking about in terms of just how to market the project itself or how to build the project for marketers using the site? Uh, the last part, the second part. OK, well, um, there hasn't been much coming in so far. In fact, in the core, we don't actually have any dashboard widgets, for example. Um, so what I've heard is that there's a company called LiveLink that's been investigating how to use commerce for you know, marketers and how, how to customize the back end for internet marketers and for salespeople. And uh, you know, if we're lucky, some of that work will end up in maybe a commerce dashboard module or something. And I, I just talked to them briefly about it at a BOF session, so I'm not tying them to anything. Um, but they're the only people that I know of so far. Um, a lot of what we've been doing and, and developing at Commerce Guys is how to you know, market you know, an e-commerce framework in a world where most people are evaluating e-commerce applications. So ours has been more from the sales of the actual project itself rather than how to manage the sales of the products e you know, you're actually selling. So, um, Any other questions? We got one, two up toward the back here. Could you, could you uh, summarize, please, uh, the state of play with regards to marketplace functionality. So sure. uh, what's the best strategy in your view, and are there any common pitfalls? Thanks. Uh, uh, Jamie, I don't suppose you want to give the mic to Damien. No, no? Oh, you want me to summarize it? It was your boff. OK, OK. There, there was, I'll, I'll take it. There, there was a boff yesterday where um, people did discuss marketplace functionality. So multiple stores, uh, different types of approaches to check out with that whether you need to have just different carts per store or somehow perform the checkout process twice for each of the different products. And you know, there, there's, there's, there's sort of a consensus that it's going to be developed soon. There's also a consensus that the core modules themselves are, are likely flexible enough as is at 1.0 plus one patch, because uh, I did commit a patch yesterday for that, um, to, to allow multiple store entities to sell products and then to allow split shopping carts 
you know, for the different types of, or for the different sellers represented, you know, in a, in a customer's current order. Um, so there's, there's, have we actually developed a client site that uses Marketplace yet? Okay. Yeah, yeah. So uh, Boyan, he actually had to fly home, but his screen name is uh, Boyan Z, uh, and so you can find him. And I think there will be a separate contrib for Marketplace on Commerce. And then you know, there's there's the core functionality that's already there uh, with our extensible into the access control, even down to the line item level on a given order. Um, so I don't think we'll be in sort of an access control or permissions hole. It's more just adding the store entity and making sure whether that's an organic group or something else and making sure that we can tag products for that and separate out the checkout workflow. So I'm pretty positive that it's, it's going to be happening soon. Uh, and Boyan's already working on it. So. Uh, we had a question in here, I think. Yeah, um, oh, if you could use the mic, please. Oh, oh, oh yeah, this guy right here. Yeah, you, you're good, Peter. Yeah, yeah, this guy, this guy. Up, up top. OK, we'll go for Joe first. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, is, is there any effort to, um, or is there already contributing modules to uh, integrate with uh, ERP systems, inventory systems, or other accounting systems? Are you aware of any, Damien? Yeah, nothing, nothing generic. I mean, we've done some use case specific stuff for various clients, um, but nothing generic other than to say that everything in commerce is an entity. So everything that uh, has data on it is either a field data or a property that Drupal knows how to access through its uh, either entity field query in core or the entity API in contrib. And so that's, you know, exposing this data, whether it's through views or through feeds or, you know, if you're bringing it in through migrate, like, that's possible, but there's nothing like, hey, this is the ERP connection module or anything. Is, is there so. any um, thought of doing that? Because, I mean, I mean every like, customer will have It'd be great, you know. <laughs> All right, but it, you know, it's kind of a matter of finding a client that needs it and um, then finding a generic solution that works for them and can work for other people. Okay. So, Thanks. Yeah, yeah. And then we had one, uh, I think, like five rows back. Oh, well, the, yeah, Peter, you can get the mic to the guy up top and then let you leave. It's just a small remark. There's a showcase um, a page on your site. Yes. But not all those sites are on it. Don't, yeah. don't forget yeah. to put that oh, I guess we need to fix that, huh? There's, there's a wiki page on DrupalCommerce.org called, I think it's just DrupalCommerce.org slash showcase. It's a wiki where you can just go and throw in a link and sort of add a little bit of a blurb about how commerce was used on a particular site. And so there's some really, really sharp looking sites. I mean, I think that Eurocenters to me is, is kind of like the pinnacle of Drupal 7 development. I think it's a really, really sharp site, really complex, and really puts Drupal 7 to the, you know, through, through its paces. But there's some other really nice sites like Cozio that demonstrates um, you know, the right to left functionality in a Hebrew, uh, with using Hebrew, and I guess it's in an Israeli store. Uh, there's some other nice sites in there that just sort of get you a broader feel for what people have done with commerce. And I think this will be the last question because I think people are getting hungry. Okay. Um, wait. I lost my question. No, no, I got it. <laughs> um, Multi-language is always a pain in the ass. Uh, how does the how do the panel people respond to that? Because how do you have do you have best practices or tips yeah. to handle multi-language? Well, you're standing right by the guy, so I'll let, I'll let Peter answer that one. Well, we went straight for entity translation because imagine like something like e h and n node sync on four hundred thirty thousand products. And we have seven languages, <laughs> no chance. But yeah. it works quite good with entity translation, uh, even if it's not really released yet. Um, I guess I have to uh, talk to the maintainer. <laughs> I, I well, promised it, Jose and Gabo, that I will talk to him tomorrow. We've, we've put patches into core for both entity translation and IATNN, right? That support, yeah. yeah, yeah. So, I mean, it, when, when you're dealing with, uh, with Drupal Commerce, that because we've separated out the definition of a product from how it's displayed and where it's displayed, there's not much to translate on the product itself other than the title. And then if you're using attributes, you know, the attribute options. When you get into that, your attributes in, uh, in Drupal Commerce are just fields. And so it's, it's just translating field data. Um, so, so if you're selling t-shirts and you need to have you know, small, medium, and large for the size translated into different languages, you just add a field to your product type, and you can have that show up on the Add to Cart form. And then you just need to make sure that Drupal knows that this is a field that should be translated, whether it's through the entity translation module or through IATN. Well, there is IATN fields that oh, does okay. that. <laughs> and all the other stuff is mostly entity translation and title module. Great. Yeah. So um, let's, let's go ahead and, and close the general Q&A there. And if you have any further questions for myself, for the panel, or any of the commerce guys, 
We'll hang around up front until we just get so hungry we have to go. Uh, and we'd be happy to hear from you, talk with you. Uh, we do appreciate your time and attention. So good luck with Drupal Comics.